I wanted you guys to maybe put in the chat um, how your prep is going in terms of whatever topics you've covered or like how you feel about sociology in particular, if there's any thoughts about it, any specific topics that would be helpful to go over, then I can keep note of those. So feel free to unmute or put in the chat. Nice. Okay. I'm glad to hear it's going well. I guess we're about, since we just started July, kind of midway through the summer, are most of you guys studying for late July or August dates? Topics on rotation. Nice. September 1st. Okay. So I guess you're about halfway, early September. Okay. August to September. Okay. So that's good. I guess you guys have still a decent amount of time. I feel like I always tell people that they have time because I only took a month to prepare. So I was very much on like rush mode, but all of you guys have over a month. So that's good. Um, yeah. So if there's any specific topics you guys want to cover again, just drop it in the chat. I'll have the chat um, pulled up, but otherwise I'll just go forward with what I have here on sociology. So to start off, most of the materials I'm using are from you world. I'll just like, Put that out there um, for my preparation I used Kaplan books and I did the practice questions on UWorld and AAMC and the practice tests from AAMC and I found UWorld to be one of the more useful um, tools, but I thought everything I did was pretty good um, for UWorld I like their answer explanations a lot, and so this is kind of taken from there, you can actually use your explanations and put them into like note cards or notebooks, so I kept my notebook from every subject and I pulled these topics from the different answer explanations they had for sociology questions. So the first thing is just like generally about sociology, there's micro and macro. So, I mean, you can kind of figure from the prefixes, but micro is just like individual interactions, whereas macro is more about bigger groups. And so you're gonna need to know a little bit about both for the MCAT, but the example they gave is pretty like medically related where micro sociology might be just like one doctor and one patient, but macro sociology would be like, how does a whole racial group get impacted um, in our healthcare system, something like that. So you're going to need to know both. And there's um, a bunch of theories of sociology that are pretty important to not just memorize, but also really understand since they're going to ask you questions. And I have some practice questions kind of embedded throughout the PowerPoint that we'll get to, but all these different theories are kind of a way to approach sociology and they might ask you either like give you a situation and say which theory kind of describes it or they might say like how would this be viewed as a functionalist or as a social constructionist and then you'd have to pick from the different options like which option matches the theory so it could go either way but it's good to be comfortable with the different theories in that sense so um i'll pause for a minute so you guys can read it and then we'll have some practice questions about them. And again, at any point, feel free to unmute to ask questions or put them in the chat.
Okay, so um, again, they kind of also say which one of these theories are more macro or micro. So for example, like symbolic interactionism, they call that micro because it's based on like little interactions, usually between just like two smaller parties, whereas something like functionalism, viewing all of society as an organism is like definitely on a macro scale. So that's some of the theories. And then functionalism to kind of uh, expand on that one particularly. I've noticed that they ask about this one a lot. Um, there's manifest functions and latent functions. So again, back to, so functionalism is viewing society as an organism and every part is trying to keep like a homeostasis in equilibrium, kind of like the human body, kind of like in bio, but now talking about social groups. So there's functions that are on purpose and then functions that kind of come about unintentionally. So manifest functions are intended, um, kind of like manifestation, something you want to happen. And so it's an obvious purpose. So for example, the education system, you're gonna learn like the skills that the curriculum is trying to teach you. That's obviously gonna happen since that's like the purpose. A latent function is something that happens unintentionally as a result. So social inequality sometimes can be, um, can be perpetrated by the education system. So for example, um, even for like the MCAT or other standardized tests, like if prep costs a lot of money, then it might be unintentionally that people from higher socioeconomic statuses are doing better on standardized testing because of just like access to preparation material. So stuff like that. So that's like unintended, that would be a latent function. Okay, now getting into questions. Um, I'll give you guys some time for every question and then you guys can drop in the chat maybe what you guys think it is from A to D. All the questions that I'm putting on here are from the AAMC question banks. So if you guys want to go back on the questions, they're in there. There's like one section bank that's just like open topics or there's like all topics. And then when you click that, it has every subject. So pull them out of the sociology part of that. So I'll give you guys a minute. And then if you don't feel like sharing to the group, you can also private message me your answer. But I'd love for everyone to kind of give the questions a try and see what they think. All right, we got a lot of C's. So yeah, the answer is C. And so basically the cross-cultural differences refers to social constructionism because it's saying that ideas are created through historical processes and then socially defined and different between cultures. So variation in mental illness um, is can be due to the different cultures and the social construction. So the the blurb, the blurb under the explanation also explains it better than I can, but good job on that one. Another question here.
Okay, awesome. A lot of people saying B. So this explanation is kind of longer, but I, what I liked about this explanation also talks about the other choices. So if we look at the other options, so B, talking about membership in the group and your social identity and connections is the correct answer in terms of symbolic interactionism. If you look at the other options, option A was about conflict theory. Um, and so it's talking about targeting people and addiction. C is rational choice theory, um, talking about how everyone has equal choices and democratic society. And then D was functionalist theory, because it's talking about really the social function. I mean, keyword function embedded in there can also give you a clue. And so these ex answer explanations are also really good in case, I mean, you could, if the question was just worded a little differently and said like the perspective of conflict theory, you should know that it would be A in that case. So it's also good to look at the other options. Awesome. So um, I think this is the third question in a row and then we'll get back to content. Yeah, so this one is a little more difficult, but I think most people were saying D, which is correct. So the the main thing here is like the unintentional injury. And then it's also kind of linked to how they say males are more likely to engage in risk taking activities that can re lead to injury. So the other things, other options we go back are more biological in terms of like puberty, testosterone, osteoporosis, but unintentional injury isn't really like a biological process. It could happen based on the social conditions that you're in. So this, that, that would be the more sociological one. So it's socially constructed in the sense that I think like males would have more of a need or more of a desire to engage in risk-taking activities and hence the unintentional injuries. All right, so back to content. So power is one concept in sociology. And so it's like controlling and influencing others. Authority are usually people um, that have that power and it also depends on if they believe the power is legitimate. So then there's three types of authority that they listed here. So traditional authority is just like longstanding authority, like a queen. Charismatic authority could be like personal appeal. So you kind of built that authority. Um, the example they gave was like Gandhi and just having like inspirational or charismatic qualities. And then rational legal authority is a professional position. So that would be like in medicine, being a physician, you had the training and have that professional position and have that power from that. So those are different types of authority. From socialization, there's also the agents of socialization. So family, friends, school or work, and mass media are the main ones. Um, there are some descriptions there. I think also this PowerPoint will be like uploaded to Canvas or sent out. So feel free to refer to that later as well. And then there's also types of social support that these agents can provide. So that could be emotional, um, esteem as well. So your own like self-esteem or encouragement and confidence in yourself. It could be tangible support, things like money, food, always important. Information is also a type of support, um, whether that's like opinion based like advice or actual facts and information. And then companionship sometimes just being there is a form of social support. So that's socialization and also when discussing socialization, they also ask about different groups. So types of groups so there's in and out. And as the name would suggest you're 
in the in group so it's one that you identify with so like we're all in group to say hopkins students but out group would be something you don't belong in so like towson students would be an out group for us um sometimes they're view reviewed unfavorably i don't know i like towson students so maybe that wasn't the best example but um another one is so reference groups are a comparison group you can kind of compare yourself to and you might or might not belong to this group so reference group could so Hopkins and Towson students, you could compare yourself to a group that you're within or not within, um, and you could compare yourself, say, on, on really anything, like your grades or your extracurriculars, whatever. Primary groups are, like, very close, and they're smaller, and then secondary groups usually come together for a purpose. So primary group would be, like, your family, and then secondary group is your coworkers, and you all came together for that job that you work at or that, that company or wherever it may be whereas primary groups you interact with them a lot more so those are different groups there's a question to go with that We got a lot of C, great. So yeah, professional athletes would be a reference group since it literally says they're comparing them to that person or that group. And um, another thing that's interesting to note is that they're saying they're in a youth sports league and they're comparing to professionals. So it can't be an in group because they're not in that group. Um, an out group would be correct. And that's why probably it's not an option, but that's also important to note since they're not in that group, it is also an out group. And as we said, reference groups you could be in or not within. So it's good to note. Um, another thing that I don't, it, this is pretty low yield, I think, but kinship. Um, types of kinship include consanguineal, consanguineal, um, and that's like a genetic relationship. That's like in, if you've taken genetics and drawn the trees, like a consanguous pair is one like two people already on the tree get married. And then affinial is based on marriage. Uh, fictive is not is just like none of the above. So adopted children, for example. And then there are degrees. So primary, secondary, and tertiary. So primary would be like your mother. Secondary is the child of a first degree, primary degree. Or sorry, primary of a primary. So your mother's brother. And then tertiary is two more. So it's just kind of like your immediate family and then their immediate family and then their immediate family but again pretty low yield so not too important roles though are more important so there's roles we play in society and then there's issues that can happen with that so there's role strain conflict and exit role exit i think the name kind of lets you know you kind of leave a role um usually you can replace it with a new one so it's saying like if you graduate and become a full time employee you're leaving the role of college student and going to full time employee, but you could also leave a role and not replace it with something. Say you were a part of like a club or something and then you drop it, you don't have to replace it with something else. And then strain and conflict conflict you would think of like two things conflicting with each other so it's when two of your roles are creating tension so you're a student you're also working part time and you don't have enough time to do both so that's like your two roles are conflicting but role strain is within. A single role there's an issue so that that one role is straining you so if it's like homework student government projects like it's all within your role as a student that would be strain so strain is within a single role conflict is like two roles conflicting with each other and then exit as the name suggests leaving a role so which of these examples would you say shows role conflict Yep, getting a lot of B in the chat. Perfect. So 
B, because the two roles that we're really seeing is being a parent and then also being an employee, whereas the other examples um, is all kind of within a single role. So B is correct. Um, some other things about like self or just like identity to theory. So there's the dramaturgical theory, which is just front stage and backstage. So like related to drama. Front stage is when people are seeing you and then backstage is kind of when you're not being viewed. So you can literally imagine a stage, I guess that's why they did it. But on a front stage, you'd be much more formal, for example, whereas in a backstage, you're kind of like talking relaxed, things like that. And then there's also looking glass self where your identity is kind of based on how other people see you. So this woman here, it's like the patients are seeing her as a nurse, kids see her as a hero. I don't know why they chose that third one. It always gets me, but her ex sees her as a villain. So those are like the different ways people see you combining to make your identity. So here's a question about the dramaturgical theory. Okay, so we have some A's in the chat, and that is correct. Pretty long explanation, but um, basically your front stage self is the part you're showing to other people. So this is true that you might modify that based on what the audience is. Your backstage self is the one that won't really change. There is no really audience to your backstage self, if that makes sense. Um, so B is incorrect because your backstage self, you're not really using in social interactions as much. Um, impression management, it, it doesn't really relate to the dramaturgical approach. Dramaturgical, again, is like the front and backstage. Um, but impression management, just to note, is that you kind of want to control how people see you. And that could be conscious or unconscious. But you hide certain parts of yourself or promote other parts to manage the impression people have of you. Um, but yeah, I think with C and D mainly, it's not related to the dramaturgical approach. So it's important to know that that's the term they use for those front and backstage selves. Another question here. Yep, getting some C's. So looking glass self, um, as we saw with the lady in the little cartoon, um, the interaction she has with her kids, paint her as a hero, and then her patients as a nurse and her ex, all those make her self concept. And so that is the looking glass self. Okay, and then other parts of sociology are networks and groups. So some of these, I mean, like social network pretty like common term but also good to know that there are different strengths to the ties so it could be a strong tie which is um kind of related to like your primary circles like family friends weak tie like an acquaintance absent tie if you just don't know the person another thing just like 
to familiarize you guys with the term, not super important, but dyad, triad, tetrad are group sizes. And then um, larger than that doesn't really have, like there's no like pentads and stuff. Um, it is also important to note that like, for some reason triads they say are very stable since if one person leaves the group, it, it'll still exist. This is kind of contrary to, I think, pop culture, because they always say that if there's three friends, one, like two of them are closer. But anyway, it's just important to know. I didn't expect that when I was studying for them, Kat. So triads are supposed to be very stable. Tetrads are the ones that they say are not stable and will just split into two and two because dyads are very intimate. So good to know the names and that three is very stable. It's also very stable architecturally with a lot of triangles. Um, another concept, if you've taken social psych, you definitely know this um, with Dragotis, but social loafing. And so it's basically if you're like in a group, you don't really have to put in much effort or you might tend to put in less effort than if you were doing something individually. So like if you're getting assigned an individual assignment, you know that the whole burden is on you and you have to get that done. Whereas in a group project, you might be like, mm, let me like wait a week and see if anyone else texts to meet up and like just putting in less effort to it since um, there are multiple people. So you can see in the tug of war there. Um, there are also different causes. So one is diffusion of responsibility. You feel less responsible. You might just not be motivated since it's not going to fall on you as much because it's like the overall group performance that's getting evaluated. Avoidance of over effort. You don't want to be the hardest working member of the group, I suppose. Lack of oversight if no one really is looking over, no one like assumes the role of leader kind of. And then it could just be a non cohesive group, um, such as, for example, like a group project, nothing is like if it's like the professor assigned the groups, nothing's really bringing you together. So social loafing there. Another thing is group polarization, again, another social psych concept. But it's basically saying that like, if you have like, an extreme group get together, they're going to become more extreme. I remember the example Professor Dragotis used was like if there's like clubs on campus, like for different political parties, like Democrats or Republicans, if you're meeting and it's just people of that perspective and that like political party, their views are more likely to get very extreme since you're only surrounded by people with the same views. So you can see negative and positive. But either way, you can see how just like there was an average and then the new average shifted wherever there were more people. So that's, you know, going to the polls. Um, other thing, so these are like terms we use in everyday life, but I guess it's important to just kind of know the more official definitions of them. So stereotypes, discrimination and prejudice are based on different things. So stereotypes based on cognition. So it's like what you're thinking discrimination based on action because you do something to discriminate against someone. Well, I hope you don't, but you know, and then prejudice is based on emotion. So stereotypes and prejudice, I think are kind of interchangeable when we use them in day to day life, but stereotypes is cognition prejudice is more emotion. You just like feel a certain way. Um, there's also deviance theories. So there's three here, differential association, labeling and strain. And so differential association is when you learn specific deviant behaviors through interacting with others um, who have that same, like those same behaviors. So you just learn it, association, you kind of learn it through other people. Labeling is, um, there's another slide on this, so we'll get more into it, but it's like one deviation leads to you getting labeled as deviant, and then you are more likely to have more deviations. And then Strain is when deviant behavior results from disconnecting between your goals and the way you would achieve those goals. So there's also types of norms and then how deviant it would be to not obey them. So folkways, mores, and taboos. So folkway is just like a light, it would be lightly deviant to not do that. So like wearing your clothes backwards, more would be just like not wearing clothes and that's more deviant. And then taboos are like, the most deviant thing you could do. And so the punishment, as you would expect, gets more serious as you go. Um, to kind of expand on labeling theory, it's that, so again, when someone's I labeled- get that. When someone's labeled as deviant, it produces further deviance. And so say you commit a crime 
and then you're convicted, it gives you this label of a criminal and it might make it harder for that person to find work or housing and things like that. And that might, you know, you also have this internalized perception that you are a criminal. It also makes it harder to, if you can't, if you don't have a job, for example, it might make you more likely to steal things like that. And so it's more likely that another crime is committed. So the fact that once you get that label of being deviant, you're more likely to do things like that again. All right, and then that's the main content I had on sociology. I have some like loose end practice questions, I think like three, and then I had some slides about like research or study methods. Um, so we'll get into the questions. If you have any questions about what I've covered, actually, maybe you should do that first. Are there any questions about what I've said? Feel free to like put in the chat or unmute. Has anything been unclear? All right, feel free to think about it if there's anything you'd like to ask put in the chat whenever but we'll also get into the loose end questions that I have these I might not have covered as much in the content but also good topics to note so we can learn through the questions. Yep, C. So medicalization is when a problem gets put into medical terminology and treated by medical professionals. Um, I actually had a CARS passage on my actual MCAT about medicalization, but yeah, good term to note. Um, didn't really know how to make a slide about it, but it's good that you guys know it. This one's also interesting, the difference between ethnicity and race. Split answers here, I think. I actually can't tell where it answers for the last one and this one, but most people said D. So yes, it is D here. Um, ethnicity is by culture, race is by physical characteristics. Um, so as it says here, sociologists consider ethnicity to be categorization of people based on culture and ancestry, but race is based on perceived physical characteristics. So it's important to note since they kind of have different definitions on different fields so it's good to know what the aamc in sociology thinks it is and then another interesting concept ethnocentrism and cultural relativism
All right, yeah, I'm seeing B mainly. So as the word kind of puts it, ethnocentrism is kind of like putting your own at the center, like your own cultural standards and beliefs and using that to judge other people. Whereas cultural volatilism is being conscious of the fact that people come from different cultures and norms and such are different in other cultures. So it's that diversity aspect. Um, so yeah, so generally like they'd say like cultural volatilism is a better perspective to have. All right, and then again, any questions at any point, put them in the chat, cut me off on mute, whatever you guys feel comfortable doing, but I guess we can move on. So the next thing I have, this kind of falls under sociology. Like you might find it in the psych social section since um, a lot of the passages are about studies. So it might be like a study in the passage, you'll have like three, four psych social questions. And the last question will be about how the study was designed, something like that. So some topics about study design. Again, these notes are from UWorld. Um, so there's different types of studies um, in the health sciences, different from obviously like the biological wet lab studies that are in the other sections. So experimental, um, you can think of that you're setting up, you're still like independent and dependent variable. So you are running an experiment. It can be a randomized controlled trial or a non-randomized design. So you can randomly put people into groups um, and then you could non-randomly put them into groups. And so, yeah, I guess the name will already tell you that. And then you can determine the efficacy of whatever intervention you're doing, whether that's like a drug or just like a strategy, saying something to someone, whatever it is. So you're kind of setting up an experiment and then there's ob observational. And so four types of those longitudinal, long, so it's like multiple time points. And then cross-sectional is, um, at one point in time, and you can see an outcome in a population, case controlled is, so cases are like different individuals with the condition you're talking about, and then controls don't have the condition. So looking at those, and then just case is like, like a case study, you're looking at one individual or a small group, like a specific case. And then a review is like, say literature reviews and stuff where you're taking other people's studies and you're combining and analyzing them to make a meta-analysis. So those are different types of studies you may come across. The study methods can be qualitative or quantitative, quantity being number. So qualitative, you're just like looking at different information, um, probably subjective, and you're looking at more usually complex processes. Whereas for quantitative, it's objective data. So it's numbers and you're using statistics usually to answer your question. Um, and it's good if it's like definable variables. So if there's something you really can put into a number like height, um, otherwise you could use like an index or like if it's something that's qualitative, you could still get that into a number like the way they rank um, the happiness of different countries or whatever. That's not inherently a number, but you can get there. So there are some examples there as well. Uh, this is like the UWorld graphic for it. In between the new thing is just there's mixed methods. So you have numbers, words, or other non-numbers, and then you could use kind of both together, and that's usually the most comprehensive way. A lot of studies will have things that are numbers as well as other um, conclusions. Another thing to note is like the difference between reliability and validity. I think this graphic kind of helps. It's also similar to precision and accuracy in say like physics. So if something's unreliable and invalid, as you can see, the darts are kind of everywhere on the left and not on the center. Reliable is like, are you getting the same result every time? So it's about precision as well. And if someone else were to do the study, would it still give you the same thing? And then validity is if you're actually correct. So they're missing um, valid and unreliable, I guess, but that would be like the dots are centered, but they're still too spread out. So hopefully this graphic kind of helps with that reliability is like, how many times can you actually like recreate the study and validity is, is what you're getting correct. Uh, there's also a lot of, of course, biases in research. Some of them are from the study, some of them are from the subjects. So in terms of the study, it's experimenter bias, question order bias, which I guess there's you know, the order you put the questions in and then sampling bias, which we'll talk about. And then on, in terms of the subjects, there's response bias, 
social desirability bias and the Hawthorne effect. Hawthorne effects kind of related to social desirability bias. So in terms of sampling bias, so um, if you have a whole population you're trying to study, obviously it might be hard to actually get like everyone in America, if that's your population, everyone in Maryland to fill out your study or get their data. So you choose like a sample. If you're doing it non-randomly, then there could be sampling bias where the sample does not represent the population. Um, so for example, non-random study samples, there could be a convenience sample. Um, so it's just who you can get the easiest. And so using just a sample of Chinese immigrant children to draw conclusions about Chinese children. So could not be accurate to actually what you're trying to study. So if it's convenient for you to interview people here instead of uh, actually going to China, for example, that'd be convenient, but not necessarily accurate. Um, a volunteer sample is only people who want to participate. And then, so if you use a, a sample of children who volunteer and are drawing conclusions about all children, you might get like the less shy ones. And you might be like, oh, like nowadays children are very social, but you're only getting the ones who actually wanted to participate or who piped up when you asked. So that could influence your results. And then a snowball sample is where people refer others. And so it's like a snowball that keeps going. And that also you can expect will not give you accurate results since the rest of your sample will be very similar or somehow related to the first person. So there's that. Um, going back, so then in terms of bias on the part of the subjects um, for response and social desirability. Response bias is anything that could like make someone respond falsely. And so social desirability is in here as a part, but the order of the questions, um, demand characteristics, if like your subjects can kind of figure out what you're trying to get them to do, um, extreme responding, courtesy bias. So you just want to be nice. If you're asking someone for feedback or asking someone to rate you, they might give you better results just to be kind. Um, there's also a type of bias, a tendency for everyone to just answer yes to every question, acquiescence bias, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, but just good to know that there's like, there can be a lot of bias in the response you're getting. And then in terms of social desirability bias, if they ask like how to reduce that in a study, um, make it anonymous is like one of the huge ways, because if you're asking someone say, for example, like their eating habits or what you ate in a day, someone could like leave out the unhealthy foods if their name is attached to response. But if it's anonymous, they won't really feel the pressure to change what they say for who's going to read it. Um, wording also can impact how people answer your questions, obviously. And then self-administered questionnaires, indirect questioning and forced choice items. So not putting like a other or a no option um, helps give more specific answers. So that is pretty much the end of the slideshow. We have about 10 minutes and I want to open it up to questions about sociology or just about anything in terms of your prep. Any questions I'd be happy to answer. You can unmute or put in the chat. Yes, the practice questions that were in the presentation are from the AAMC question bank. There's a way to get to sociology. I can try to find how. There's like one of the banks is just like all questions and under there, I went to the sociology section. Yeah, it is in the bundle. Um, I'm not sure exactly how all the bundles work, to be honest. I was under like the fee assistance, so I just like got the whole thing, but it's part of that, if that's what bundle means. I can show you how to get there as well. Let me log into my AMC account. Mm, it's called an independent question bank. So if I share my screen again. So yeah, so in this hub, I went to the independent question bank, because I think other than that, there's no psych question pack. So 
under the independent question bank, there's like 25 per subject or something. And so I pulled them right out of sociology. They also have like 25 for all of the other topics as well. Cars practice, yeah. So I think for cars, practice questions are what I found most helpful. Um, you can't really like learn it the way you can learn bio or chemistry. So definitely questions. And a lot of people say for cars, like the official practice test and like the AAMC stuff is a little bit better than say U World. U World is usually better with like the more factual stuff. I found that as well. So I would just say practice questions of whatever form you can really get them in. But um, I thought the AAMC practice sections were good as well. Also good to just like see what type of questions you're getting wrong because they categorize the questions. It might, you might not be able to tell yourself the way you can with like, like bio, you can be like, oh, I'm getting all of the kidney ones wrong. But for cars, you might be getting a certain type wrong. Like what is the main message of the passage or something like that. So try to see when they classify the questions, is there like a pattern in the ones you're getting wrong? And then looking into that more, always good to like reflect on how you're doing, but I would definitely say just getting into practice questions. And then if there's like specific things you can identify, you can search up strategies, just like Google those or watch, I'm sure there's like videos and stuff as well. Timing might also be another thing. If it's timing, then I would also say practice questions and just like reading. One thing that helped me was like using the highlight feature. Um, at first I wasn't, but then I later found that highlighting things helped me look back at the passage and only like kind of be able to see the parts that stood out to me on first read. So like if you're trying to look for the message, it might be something that came across to you. It should be something that came across to you on your first read before you were even asked, things like that. No problem. Any other questions? If no questions, another thing I'll ask you guys in the future, I'm doing like the physics or go and math ones. Are there anything specifically in physics or go or math that you feel like you're struggling with or you would like to see maybe not like explain now but just like when I do the session it would be good to put in my content feel free to drop any topics you'd like me to review. Optics like lenses and mirrors and stuff, I think I have those in the PowerPoint. Include files, leaving groups. Uh, okay, I will definitely screenshot these. Thank you for the input. Circuits, nice. It's a lot of the, the physics two stuff, it seems. Yeah, I guess if there aren't any other questions, equations, okay, good to know. If there aren't many other questions, that's pretty much all I have from the slides. Hopefully this helps for sociology. Um, and I'll put my email in the chat. I guess you can get it just by searching up my name. But if you have any other questions, feel free to reach me at any point. Um, would love to help you guys out if there's anything you'd need. Otherwise, thank you for coming.